know when you're on a date and like, things are going really well and you just want to do one more thing? Come on, baby, let's go find a taco truck. Because you, you saw every dance move I got the first five minutes we were here and every song is starting to sound the same as I hear it through your eyes. Come on, baby, let's go find a taco truck. Because we ate like five hours ago. And who are you kidding by just having that salad? Come on, baby, let's go find a taco truck. We can cruise the west side from Callahan to Culebra, Commerce to Castroville. Let's drive with the windows down and dance in our seats to whatever Jam and Jay's got on the ones and twos. Come on, baby, let's go find a taco truck. I'll drive with one hand on the wheel and the other one on your thigh, and you can kiss me at the stoplight. Come on, baby, let's go find a taco truck. We'll order some mini tacos de carne asada, sprinkle some cebolla y cilantro on them, and some of that green salsa. Let's enjoy them as we lean on the hood of my Impala and share a Mexican Coke. They say that cane sugar makes it sweeter, but I won't believe them till I taste it from your lips cool from that last swig. Come on, baby, let's go find a taco truck. Or maybe we can just drive west into the madrugada because tomorrow's coming fast and I want to outrun the daylight with you. In case you all don't know me, my name's Eddie Vega and I write that taco poetry. That papas con huevo, chorizo con huevo, jamón con huevo, napolitos con huevo, sausage con huevo, weenie con huevo, anything else you can think of, con huevo, poetry. That put bacon on it, poetry, put cheese on it, poetry, that you ain't down unless you've had chicharron or machacado or lengua, poetry. That I write that corn tortillas go better with barbacoa, poetry. That, well, you can use flour tortillas, but there better be an avocado up in there, poetry. The it don't matter because there's going to be big red at breakfast and that's what makes us special and diabetic, and, but we don't give a damn in South Texas poetry. <laughs> I write that taco poetry, that carne asada from the taco truck in front of the, pl the place that used to be hard bodies, poetry. <laughs> With mariachis and hipsters and teachers and cholos and chulas is all standing together in line because we're a familia on a Saturday night, poetry. I write that taco poetry, that my tia makes it better than your tia, makes it better than your tia, better than your tia, better than your tia, that my abuelita invented the carne quesada and cheese taco, pero like for real poetry. <laughs> I write that my mama made bean and cheese tacos with beans that she made for the week and slices of processed cheese cut into two perfect triangles and put uh, into the microwave for precisely 13 seconds poetry. <laughs> I write that taco poetry, that the best tacos are from the south side poetry. Unless you grew up on the west side, poetry. <laughs> that east side got its tacos too, poetry. And the north side has a bunch of fresas that don't appreciate Tex-Mex. But we're not gonna be haters! Because tacos bring love and poetry. I write that taco poetry. That everyone has their favorite taco spot poetry because we buy our tacos from restaurants that are named for cooks. Rolando's, Pete's, Eddie's, Tommy's, Henry's, Danny's, Tita's, Linda's, Patty's, Ruthie's, Chela's, Rosa's, and about 138 places from Jalisco, poetry. <laughs> And don't get me started on Austin, because I write that fuck Torchy's poetry. <laughs> and this city, tacos are holy, el pastor es mi señor poetry. Not that burrito poetry, burritos are all wrapped up in themselves. But tacos are open and open and open to receive your love and poetry. My name's Eddie Vega, they call me the taco poet of Texas. And like all the best breakfasts in this town, my poetry is served con huevos. Because I write that, puro tejano, little Joey La Familia, take it away, you got it, puro pinche taco, poetry. All right, so, all right, I'm Norma Martinez. Um, thank you, guys. All right, so we're talking Tex-Mex today, and so we're really excited to get you guys here today. It was sort of called the Great Tex-Mex Debate, but I don't think there's any debating about Tex-Mex here. It's just going to be a great conversation, and it's going to be interactive between us and with you. We're inviting you to, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you know, we have a microphone here set up for you. Uh, just make sure you keep them brief because we only have an hour. We do want to thank the sponsors who made this happen. We want to thank the City of San Antonio World Heritage Office, City of San Antonio Arts and Culture Department, and Frost Bank. We also want to thank... Sticks and Stones, you got uh, Sticks and Stone, you got to enjoy some of their tacos today. Uh, Taco Fest as well for making it possible. We want to thank Desert Door, who are going to be providing drinks afterwards. And we want to thank DJ Despeinada over here, whose hair looks beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I think we're ready to get underway. So instead of boring you with long introductions of my guests, I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. So I'm gonna start on my left here with Gustavo. Gustavo. 
Hello, my name is Gustavo Arellano. I'm a columnist for the Los Angeles Times, author of Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America, and your token Californian here. Hi, I'm Melissa Guerra, and I am from the Rio Grande Valley, and I used to have a store here in San Antonio, but now I am retired from that, and so I'm a blogger, and I write about food history, and I'm super interested mostly in the food history of the border because it's a lot more than people know. It's so compelling. She also wrote a cookbook. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years ago. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jose Rolat. Uh, I'm the Texas Monthly Taco Editor. Uh, thank you. The author... The author of American Tacos, a history and guide, which is for sale and you should buy so I can sign it. <laughs> um, there's a lot to mail them here. <laughs> uh, and I am a fierce lover of Tex-Mex. And I am Stephen Pizzini. I own Lala's Gorditas on the south side of San Antonio on Roosevelt. Okay, so to start off with, um, about a week ago, we all had sort of a little Zoom get together to talk about what we were going to be talking about today. And I think that itself could have been a great panel because we had some amazing conversation. And one of the things that came up during this panel, um, Steve, you shared a story about the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, and Tex-Mex. I was Tex -Mex. hoping you would have opened I, I have to. <laughs> and, and just so we know, uh, just so you know, it, there are there any young children here? <laughs> we, we, we can, if, if we, you feel the urge to express, express yourself, myself. you may. <laughs> in, in my native language. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Steve, go ahead and share that story for us. Uh, I went to the Culinary Institute's uh, Conference on Latin American Cuisine. It was a two-day affair, and they uh, presented uh, 10 chefs each day. Correct, Elizabeth? I just heard about the 10. Oh, well, Elizabeth was one of the, the guest panelists of that, that day, so I'm glad that, glad that you're here. And uh, so... There was only one chef, and it was a bunch of chefs presenting food. And uh, so there was one chef from San Antonio. Her name was Sophia. I don't can't remember her last name. She's a pastry chef. What was that? Tejeda. Tejeda. And uh, she presented conchas. And I believe she's now at Miskmi. Is that correct? Oh, I got it backwards. Okay. So, uh, and so after. Um, she presented her food. Uh, there was a microphone available, and I spoke up about the fact that I was disappointed that there was no Tex-Mex food being represented in the conference. And uh, and I was made to feel like that wasn't uh, an appropriate thing to say. <laughs> and, uh, and ever since then, uh, I had got up on a little soapbox about Tex-Mex food because in, in that, uh, that auditorium, and there was about 150 people there, I, I spoke to the fact that we are a city of gastronomy. Colleen Swain is here from the World Heritage Organization. And I spoke to Colleen about, about that. And, uh, and in that conference, I said, you know, Tex-Mex is, uh, is San Antonio, and we should celebrate Tex-Mex food. You know, in my opinion, that Tex-Mex food uh, was born in San Antonio, because you can't go out, of, you can go out of San Antonio, you will not experience the same Tex-Mex cuisine that you you have here in San Antonio. And my family's been making Tex-Mex food since 1938. My aunt, and I wish my cousin was here, owned and operated the Tec Molino. I, I don't know if any of y'all have heard of that restaurant. They're still in business. They've been in business for over, I don't know, I guess going on 70. Uh, when? 37, so do the math. I don't know what that is. Uh, so, and my father started the taco hut on the southeast side of San Antonio. My mother, who just turned 98 today, Josephine. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's her birthday today, 420. And she's never, had, she's never gotten stoned. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, 
My mother took that business over in the 60s when my father passed away at a young age, and I took it over in 1984. So I, you know, I spoke to the fact at that conference that, you know, my family has a legacy of serving Tex-Mex food here in San Antonio. And again, we should celebrate it instead of dismiss it. And, and, and where, and I had noticed also on social media, and if I'm taking up too much time, stop me. But I had noticed on social media that Lala's in particular was getting a lot of negative comments to the fact that it wasn't authentic Mexican food. And I would reply, well, no, dumbass. It's authentic Tex-Mex Tex food, you know? So, uh, and, and since then, I got on a soapbox. I was interviewed on CNBC by some journalist, and uh, Shepard Smith opened up the show saying that the death of Tex-Mex, and that was pretty shocking right there because they never, never mentioned that when they interviewed me for that segment. And uh, I've been interviewed a couple of times with local journalists, journalists about Tex-Mex food, and then Colleen and I got together, and that's how all this came about, through Colleen's... Um, Mentorship, insistence, I don't know. <laughs> Advocacy. <laughs> and so, and here we are. Well, Jose, uh, Jose, I'd like to ask you, I mean, most of us, when we go out to eat and we are eating what's known as Tex-Mex, we usually say we're going to go out to eat Mexican, right? So what is the difference, do you think, between Tex-Mex and Mexican, because I mean, there, you can't even say there's an authentic Mexican cuisine, right? Because there are so many different regions in Mexico that have their own different cuisines and they probably look their, look down their nose at the other states, right? So um, for us to be doing it here to ourselves seems, um, and to, you know, it just doesn't seem right. So if you could maybe tell us what you think uh, the perception is that the differences between uh, Tex-Mex and Mexican. Well, I think that the only real difference is that there's a river in, that's in the way. That's right. Uh, because if you just go over the water, it's the same freaking food. <laughs> uh, and uh, really, Tex-Mex I see is one chapter within the narrative of Mexican food. Uh, what we know is Tex-Mex spun out of a couple of wars and um, the cut off or the cutting off of markets. So we had to improvise. And, you know, those wars plunged people into poverty. They had their land taken from them. Uh, so they were dependent upon commodities, uh, like government cheese, which led to queso. <laughs> uh, and, and if you want jelly con queso without Velveeta, that's fine. <laughs> but it's already perfect. <laughs> um, and... Really, that's it. It's just a story of regional innovation. Uh, it just happens to be on the other side of w one river. And so, Melissa, you're on the you're in the Rio Grande Valley. You're on the border, and I think myself also being uh, coming from the border, we kind of see our parts of Texas as being sort of the we're the we're Mexican, right? We're not Tex-Mex. So, I'm, can you give us maybe a, a a view as to how uh, Tex-Mex is viewed in the Valley. Oh, goodness. It's just regular food. It is just there what we go. do. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and I, you know, and I, I appreciate Tex-Mex being called out as a true cuisine because it's a cuisine of the Americas. I mean, I, because I live on the border and like my husband was born in Reynosa. Well, you know, he's born in McAllen, but he was grew up in Reynosa. I grew up on the U.S. side. And so this idea, this political boundary dividing our food is not true because before any of us got to this area, I, I don't know who among us are indigenous, but the indigenous were there. And so there was no political boundary. There was a river that drew everyone together. So between Monterrey and San Antonio, like there's two rivers, the San Juan and, and the San Antonio River, and then you have the Noises and you have the Rio Grande. So these were gathering points for the indigenous and the indigenous are the basis for 
our, for any cuisine, a absolutely. So instead of us saying that we're here and you're there, like it is, it is a regional cuisine that belongs to now two nations, but the region of this cuisine is determined by the geography and not by the political, the, the, the economic, not the socioeconomic or the politics. It's determined by our atmosphere, by our geography, and by the rivers and the people that are drawn to those rivers. And that's the way it's always been. As we've gotten more towards the 19th and 20th century and politics has divided us more, we've, we have more of this attitude, it seems, of like, well, that's different from me. Well, you know, but that's not, that's not the foundation of, of our cuisine. Our cuisine has always been what our land provided and what our land produced. And um, so anyway, I would really hope that during this conversation, we can get back to that idea of how our, our geographical, the geographical offering is what, our, what forms our cuisine. It's absolutely unique. And uh, before we move on to uh, Gustavo, I do want to mention that this Tex-Mex conversation is part of a great SA series on the food waste of the region. And we are going to be having a panel on the indigenous food way. So um, we're talking mostly about, you know, the whole Tex-Mex label, but there is um, there is a Texas Mexican uh, cuisine where um, I already forgot what this filmmaker's chef's name. Adan Medrano. Adan Medrano. That's right. He's going to be involved in the next conversation and he's sort of championed that. And um, so that's what we're not really going to be talking about the indigenous food waste so much. There's going to be another panel that's going to focus exclusively on that. And there's also going to be another panel on the Polish food inspirations here in the region. And, and that's going to be in the fall. Those two are in the fall. Coming up in the summer, there's going to be a special Juneteenth presentation of the uh, African-American cuisine here in San Antonio. So I hope you guys will come back for these panels. They're gonna be really exciting. Okay, Gustavo, you are coming in all the way from Los Angeles to talk about Tex-Mex. Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> because I am the grandest defender of Tex-Mex food, of someone who has no ties to Texas at all. I have no ties at all. I am the one who wrote the book on Mexican food in the United States. I am the one who at one point thought Tex-Mex food was a bunch of inauthentic gabacheria. You know, just a bunch of gabacheria. Yeah, yeah, you can boo me. That's okay. <laughs> but then, <laughs> then I actually did the history. And so, you know, my book came out in 2012 and I tracked the history of Mexican food in the United States. The stories that all of you know, the Chili Queens, Geb Hearts, uh, you know, uh, este, of course, faj fajitas went up to Houston, of course, but nachos via Frank Liberto, all the different things that influenced Mexican food across the United States. I also talked about, and all of, again, all of you know this history, but the rest of the country doesn't, when and who created this label of Tex-Mex food somehow being evil. And we all know who it was. It was Diana Kennedy, who UTSA has all the papers from, but you want to talk about problematic, there it is. Um, and to answer the question of why people have this distaste for Tex-Mex food, it's, 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 all, it's false, yes, but there's two things going on. On one hand, you do have Americans who are always looking for the next quote-unquote authentic thing. I mean, here you had, you know, the original restaurant, uh, what's his name, Otis Farmsworth, talking about how he sells an authentic Mexican dinner. This is in the early 1900s. So the idea of Americans wanting authentic Mexican food, they're always going to look to the next quote-unquote authentic thing. But then you also had the Chicano movement of the 1960s, which spread across through Texas, yes, all across the United States. And there you had this idea that anything that's even vaguely Americanized somehow is not really Mexican. So we're going to start celebrating the food of the immigrants that come up here. Then you have immigrants. I'm the child of immigrants from the state of Zacatecas. I always tell people I'm the type of Mexican that when I heard the name Cesar Chavez, I thought about the boxer, Julio Cesar Chavez. <laughs> but we come with our own traditions. We see the combo platters. And by the way, California has its own style of this called Calmex food, also with our own, you know, with our own combo platters. But we see these combo platters. We're like, ¿Qué chingada es esto? <laughs> Esta no es comida mexicana. This is not Mexican food. And so we start doing that. But I do think now with panels like this, and even in California, there's this grudging respect. And like what, what Jose said, and understanding, like this is the food of 
our ancestors, even if we you know, do not come necessarily from that, these are people who had to deal with all this crap in the past. These are also the people, the, you know, the people who made this food are the people who fought in World War II, are the people who fought for civil rights, are the people who created everything that allows us to be, yes, we're still far, far away from any equality in this country, but all of, that, all of those battles were fueled by Tex-Mex food. They really were. Well, I want to remind you, if you have any questions or comments, there's a microphone right there. Um, we'd be we'd love to be able to hear what you have to say. So make, make sure you step up and we'll acknowledge you here shortly. Um, so, Steve, um, do you kind of have that sense there with Lalas Gorditas? We have, um, you know, when we go out to eat, we don't think about sort of the history behind the food we're eating. Um, you, I understand, put the history inside of your food. You nixtamalize your corn. So can you tell us about uh, that conscious decision in really making your food so authentic? Well, we've always done that. Uh, Ernestine Pizzini Chapa started nixtamalizing masa in 1938. That's our family's legacy. I have a machine in our store. Jose saw it the other day that my great uncle Frank invented in 1932, a, a, a molino. And, uh, <laughs> it's old and beautiful. Uh, 1932, the, the original Mocajeta stones that are in that machine, are they're the original stones. They've never been taken out of there. So, you know, we make masa. I, I feel like that's our family legacy, you know, my family legacy, my legacy, when I touch those stones every day to make masa, you know. Uh, so that, you know, portion of uh, our menu is authentic. You can't get any more authentic than nixtamalizing corn. It's the foundation of Mexican cuisine, right? Tortillas. So um, this whole thing about Tex-Mex food and, uh, I, you know, when I was a child, we didn't call it Tex-Mex food. We called it Mexican food, right? So maybe it did come from Diana Kenny. I don't know. I heard the other day it came from the New York Times in the 60s. She's the one who started this false uh, narrative that Tex-Mex food is disgusting and that Tex-Mex food is not real Mexican food. I mean, really, from there, because Diana Kennedy, she, to her credit, she really did a great job in showing the rest of the United States regional cuisines from Mexico. Her cookbooks are absolutely great, and she she did the work. But my issue with her was that, okay, you could celebrate that regional cuisine, but why did you have to trash the cuisine of people who are already here? This is as Mexican as the food of Mexico, you know, Américo Paredes, made, you know, the, the legendary Chicano scholar, I always love his idea, and Jose put this, of greater Mexico. It's not just the river, it's just not la frontera over where we're at. Mexico goes to wherever Mexicans are, where the idea of Mexican food is. So. You know, and this was Mexico, you know? Yeah, that too, yeah. So, so Mordorki would still is. Well, you know, I, and I, I think I told y'all the, the, the other day, you I know? spent $3,000 <laughs> in 1996, hired a patent attorney and sloganized or patented the copyrighted the slogan where the Mex got the Tex. <laughs> put it up on a big billboard on Highway 37 on one side, I put where the Tex got the Mex, on the other side was where the Mex got the Tex, so I didn't have to spend another $3,000 for that one, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I, again, I just it just kind of infuriates me and insults me to, to think that what I've been doing, what my mother's been doing, what my aunt has done uh, since the 30s is, is not a cuisine or it's not sufficient enough. You know, you know while you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about Indian fry bread and to say that that doesn't have a story and that it's not authentic. That's that's. Uh, that's very disrespectful. Yeah, it's so because, personal to me, you know. You know, my well, but I mean, but something I like do it in, every day. Like Indian fry bread, right? like they were on on the reservation, they weren't given corn. I mean, they just were given white flour, and they did the best that they could. I mean, if people here were using processed cheese or whatever ingredients that they could get a hold of or whatever they could afford, that doesn't make it less of a cuisine. Um, I mean, if we started, if, if we have a tradition of cheese and meat here, it's because that's what our arid temperature will allow. It takes less water to raise a cow than it does a crop. And so we have a lot of cheese. Terrific. So, uh, but queso fresco doesn't last forever and Velveeta does. So, you know, so, and, you know, we, we have to be economical. So, but I, I don't think having a different food, like maybe what, if Diana Kennedy had seen our ingredients as being less than, it doesn't make our cuisine less than. I agree We're with working that, one hundred percent. Well, you thank know, you for being. Those, are, being, those you are, for, are like eight words that she wrote. 
every it was eight words. It was a passing reference. No, but she trashed yeah. the Tex-Mex food anytime she had the opportunity That's to. Shame true, on but her. But in print, it was only eight words. Let's <laughs> rise up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have one brave person who's the first one to ask a question. So what's your name and what's your question? Your comment? Felipe Barrera. Hi, everyone. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm also from the Valley. I'm from McAllen. 956! Grew, grew up on both sides. Reynosa, McAllen. At least 956. Uh, child of immigrants. So... I've gotten to know a lot about Diana Kennedy, but my experience with Tex-Mex and kind of this negative connotation from it came from my parents, actually. It was like my mom and my dad who were here, and then we would go somewhere to eat, and they'd be like, oh, this isn't this isn't me- real food. This isn't Mexican. You can eat better at home. And there was a lot of factors that I think affected that, like affordability, like maybe we shouldn't, we actually can't afford to go eat. <laughs> out somewhere so we're just gonna go home and cook more there um but that was something i grew up hearing a lot like oh no that's not that's not that's not real mexican food we're just gonna eat at home and i think that's something that a lot of people especially immigrants or at least a lot of uh, people who've been in my situation have heard a lot so i i think for a lot of audiences definitely diana kennedy was like that vocal person that was maybe the one that was trashing, but I will say there's also like a generational, more like personal thing. And so for me, that was my experience. Do you remember if it was the spices in particular or anything particular about your memory that like the restaurant that food made them feel that way about it? Like what would they criticize specifically? Yeah. At oh, the they criticize everything. The beans. <laughs> I mean, my mom, even to this day, my mom has opinions about uh, beans and everything, but it's, but it's gotten better over time too. And I think, um, I've learned a lot. I think what's what I and I really do think like talking to my parents going back a lot of it was they just didn't know any better. There was an affordability issue. Um, but for me, what really changed is once I actually started talking to the people, the restaurant owners, the people who were cooking, I'm like, they're just like us, mom. Like it's you know, it is it is real food. It's just maybe not what you're used to. Um, so that's just another kind of comment I wanted, wanted to add. Cause I mean, uh, I've gotten to, to know a lot about Diana Kennedy, a lot about Diana Kennedy recently, <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, uh, nev- never in that context up until recently, but that was just my experience. And I think there's probably a lot more of that out there that is an issue. And I think there's probably a way of addressing it too. Felipe. Uh, will you take your parents to Lala's? <laughs> no, I'm not yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah. I'm not kidding because I was there last week. And yes, it is Tex-Mex, but but corn is the centerpiece. Everything from the bean cups to the gorditas, everything is about the corn. You can't get more Mexican than well, that. Well, you know, and 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 speaking to that, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Speaking of that, you know, uh, food is, just brings so much uh, a memory, you know. Uh, we have a third-generation clientele coming into Lala's from the Taco Hut, right? And they remember the smells, you know. They come in the kitchen because we don't have a public restroom. So, yeah, psh, is it the health department here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have to go into the kitchen and use our bathroom, right? So, um, But they remember the smell and, and, you know, the puffy tacos and the guacamole cups and the bean cups and the bean rolls, you know? But, you know, you have a memory of your childhood and, you know, what you experienced. And, and, and that's so uncritical and so important, you know? And uh, it's, it's very special. I'll also say I think they were just growing up themselves where – they didn't really grow up going out to eat anywhere. Like everything was made at home. So I think that idea in of itself of them going out to eat somewhere made them uncomfortable or has even now I struggle like taking them out to eat somewhere. <laughs> like I have to twist their arms. I'll let them you know? in the kitchen and they can come, they can come cook themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let your mother stir the beans. <laughs> there's, they there's, probably would. There, but, there's but, but thank you. A well-known local story, but you were talking about Diana Kennedy and, and I wonder if Elizabeth could verify this, but that she visited local HEB and we have Chile Guajillo, but here locally we call it Chile, Chile Cascabel. And she had like a meltdown because she's like, eso no es chile bajillo. <laughs> o sea, eso no es chile cascabel, es chile bajillo. 
And but it's every time you go into H E B, it says Chile Cascabel because that's what we call it here locally. But it is Chile Guajillo because Cascabel is a totally different deal. But but does that make it less authentic? You know, I mean, it, just because she had a perspective from a more interior uh, Mexican style of food, that doesn't make our words and our it doesn't invalidate us. No, no, like, I, I agree. You know, yeah. you know, but uh, but where were you, are you? But you were your parents born? It, Border. On the border? Oh, oh but they're from Reynosa. They're from Reynosa. Yeah. I bet they're, I wonder if my husband knew them. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, they were there forever. Like, you know, like, we'll talk. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, so the mic is open to anybody else who would uh, like to make a question or a comment. Um, so we have someone. I, all right, one more. What's your name? And yes, your hi, I'm Edmund Tijerina. I know three <laughs> of you. <laughs> and uh, my question my question is drawing the distinction between kind of home cooking and restaurant cooking. Because, I mean, growing up in a you know, San Antonio Mexican family, my mom always made fresh flour tortillas, uh, chorizo con huevo on, uh, you know, on weekends. But when we would go out for Mexican, now granted this was in the 70s and the 80s, it would be places that would, they were like ponchos. And I don't know if anybody remembers ponchos. Ponchos! Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, it was chili gravy on corn tortillas. And, I mean, nobody made that stuff at home. So I, I'm just wondering, I mean, what distinctions do you draw between kind of home cooking versus restaurant cooking? And is all of that Tex-Mex? Who wants to tackle that? My wife's grandparents made chili gravy. And one of them was Mexican. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, awesome. Uh, well, we never made Mexican food at home because we had a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we ate. Yeah, all, Melissa, you're a cookbook author. Yeah, no, we just make it at home, and uh, I'm like Felipe's family. Like we go out, we're like, ew, you know, like we 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 make everything at home. But yeah, there is kind of distinction as to like what what would happen at home and and what would happen in a restaurant setting. But it's like the combination, everything on the plate all at once, you know, everything all at once, you know, like the movie, you know, like it just all happens on the plate. So maybe that is a distinction with restaurants, you know, um, but yeah, at home, it's just, it's like one or the other, but not the whole combo plate. But that would be the one different, but yeah, we don't do the enchiladas all as that often at home. I'd rather go out. It's also what hits to the public because, you know, I'm obviously talking from California, but I'll connect it to Texas. So my family's from the state of Zacatecas. And so growing, well, so in 2017, uh, someone comes up to me because I, I used to be a food critic as well. They're like, have you ever had birria de res? And I'm like, yeah, why? Where did you have it? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I, that was asking me, like, have I ever drank water before? <laughs> because in Zacatecas, that's the type of birria we eat. And birria is a stew. Usually it's uh, birria de chivo, goat stew. But in, in Zacatecas and parts of Jalisco, it's birria de res. So there's a humongous Zacatecano diaspora in Southern California, like half a million of us going back over a century. And you would never find that dish in restaurants. You would always make it at weddings, at quinceañeras, at our big feasts, basically. And then... Somehow there was one restaurant, uh, Burrito La Palma, uh, they're from my part of uh, Zacatecas. They started selling these little burritos with birria de res, and it became a hit. And then everyone started copying birria de res. And so I've always been dumbfounded. I'm like, I've had this my entire life, and now it's a trend. So last year I came for Taco Fest. Jose took me to a spot, and lo and behold, he's like, oh, yeah, these people now have birria de res. And like, I didn't, th I that's not Tex-Mex food. That's Zacatecano food, but it's a trend. And well, I'll, I'll leave that it's part for later. It's Tex-Mex now. On. It's Tex-Mex yeah, now, but that, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. At what, so at certain point, food goes from the home front into the, the restaurant tours. Restaurant tours are smart. They know what's going to sell. So for whatever reason, the for decades in, in, in Southern California, no one wants to sell birria de res because no one knew what it was. Now everyone wants birria de res. So even here in Texas, people are going to start selling it because that's what sells. And especially now with Instagram and all that, trends trends happen immediately. It's not like it takes years for it for migration to take around, you know? Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else wants to come up, feel free to... Ask a question. We got one more. Hi, what's your name? You're not even going to be a oh. moderator. Or are you just adjusting the mic? Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I was watching um, 
of recording that Gustavo, you and Jose did earlier this week with Nuestra Palabra Latino Writers having their say uh, from Houston. And I think it might have been you, Jose, who said that San Antonio has kind of an inferiority complex. It and does. Regarding its cuisine, can you can you explain? Yeah, God forbid anyone say breakfast tacos are from any place else, right? Uh, <laughs> because uh, people have fought wars for that and uh, s- signed petitions. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. Ah. Uh, I'm getting tired of holding up your chips, people. (laughs) Uh, And there's nothing to feel bad about. You guys are awesome. (laughs) You guys create food that is alive. It's ever-changing. Tex-Mex isn't something in the past. It's now, and it's delicious it's ever changing it crosses for from the home to the restaurant pretty easily crispy dogs are starting to pop up everywhere thing. they're so good and where did they come from they came from everyone's so home right guess who doesn't have crispy dogs austin <laughs> not yet not yet yeah but so so just, just <laughs> Just like you wear those fantastical fiesta medals, wear wear your history and don't worry about what anyone else has to say about it. Because everything that has to be said, it you guys live it. We have another question or comment. Your name, please. Hey, everybody. Uh, super excited about this conversation. I was really looking forward to tonight's uh, discussion on Tex Mex. My name is Johnny Nojosa. I work with a youth arts education program called CC. Um, a big fan of. Uh, I, I, I will start my question with the understanding and knowledge that San Antonio has the best breakfast tacos, period. <laughs> no matter, regardless of Austin, Houston, that, whatever. <laughs> You know, we all know that that is the case. But the other piece is what I would love to hear your, there's maybe a double question here. Um, I would love to hear your response to the regionality of Tex-Mex. Because I was born and raised in La Frontera, El Paso, Texas. My father, uh, his family came from McAllen, the Nuevo Leon area. My mother's uh, parents came from Chihuahua. The distinct difference between food in El Paso to food in San Antonio is really broad. And part of that is is because what you can grow, right? In El Paso, we have these beautiful sort of uh, places that you can uh, hatch chilies. We're closer, we're closer to New Mexico than we are to, to anywhere else. To anywhere else. <laughs> but mach- machaca here is dried beef. Machaca in El Paso is brisket with white cheese and hatch chilies. And so I don't even want to, we, if we want to go to the distinctions and difference between Houston, Austin, and Dallas, sure. But can you talk a little bit about the fact that they're all relative important, but it is, again, you have to look at it in a broad lens versus anything else. And then the last sort of conversation and discussion that I'd love to get your input on is flour tortillas versus corn tortillas. <laughs> um, I am. I, I have Chilango friends, and they laugh at our flour tortillas, right? Because, again, it was the region, it was the area, it was maiz, it was corn. But flour tortillas is important to Tex-Mex food, important to San Antonio food. And I've heard, I've, we've had conversations about it, Colleen. But the context is the two things that I've heard about it. One is when the Spanish came to colonize, they said, this corn, no, we're gonna plant wheat. And therefore that sort of took off. But I recently heard a story about um, Jewish people who did not want to admit their Jew- Judaism in Monterrey. And they, because they, they create uh, unleavened bread, that was the context of why we also have flour tortillas. So regionalism between the s- different cities and areas of Texas and the issue with flour and corn. 
Okay, so before yeah. we, we answer that, I just want to say, coming from El Paso as well, I have never had flour tortillas as good as they make in San Antonio. I don't know <laughs> what it is about the city, but you make amazing flour tortillas. Um, and our another thing... Um, in El Paso are this big. Yes, Ooh, that's, the other part. that's right, that's right. And we also eat our menudo with bolillos. We don't eat them with tortillas. So <laughs> when I got here, I was like, you're giving me a tortilla with my menudo? What? What? But anyway, go ahead. Answer the question. <laughs> Can I take that? Yeah, please. So uh, I'm really happy that you didn't call El Paso and food Mexican, not Tex-Mex, uh, because every other El Paso one does. Uh, the, so flour tortillas are almost mythical in their history. Uh, they were brought by the Spanish priests, you are right, to, to replace corn. But it can only grow in the north. Uh, and so they used it to make communion wafers. Everyone else just took advantage of it. And yes, a lot of the people living up here and going up into New Mexico were crypto Jews. They were conversos. Uh, this is as far north as they could get. And the Inquisition followed them. It's just that wheat was so plentiful, flour tortillas became the default. Uh, religion is a minor player in that now. Uh, but regionality, I've heard Del Rio... Tex-Mex food. I've heard of um, well, uh, San Antonio, um, Lubbock, and that shit from Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Dallas. <laughs> and we thought he was from Austin, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to jump in and just talk. When I, when I talk about food history, there's three things that I always talk about. It's free flourished and favored in all cuisines, and especially Tex-Mex, is based on, first of all, what's free, what we can find around here. Uh, so pecans are native, uh, cactus. You know, These are the basic, basic, most basic elements of our Tex-Mex cuisine. After that comes flourished. And so to John's point, what flourishes in El Paso is uh, hatch chilies, but then what flourishes in the valley is very different. And we have more like Chile Serrano and Chile Poblano and that sort of thing. So so what flourishes then is our second layer of our cuisine here. And then what's favored is the third most outer ring of this bullseye of our cuisine. And that is what do people like? I mean, what that that comes way after because if you start with what for me, free food is always del the most delicious food. <laughs> and Jose bought me a crispy dog, and let me tell you, that was so good because I didn't pay for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> free food is always the the kernel, the 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 nidus of cuisine, and so and that starts with the indigenous layer of Tex-Mex, and then flourished would be and. And let me go into free a little bit. Do you know that one of the oldest discoveries of um, the cultivation of corn uh, is in Ocampo, in the state of Tamaulipas, which is not that far from us. It's about an hour and a half drive. If I could drive freely across the border, which I cannot right now, but if I could drive freely from Tamaulipas, uh, drive across Tamaulipas, it's about an hour and a half from where, you know, from the border. Uh, but the oldest evidence of cultivation of corn is in Tamaulipas. I mean, that we're making ethanol out of corn. Like this is a global significance and it's just like right there. So, and these are our, these are the, the indigenous tribes of our area that, that were here and that were cultivating that. I, I, I can't remember the name of the year right now, so I'm not going to say it. But it was, not, it was uh, I want to say, well, I'm not going to say. Anyway, uh, so, and then, and then Flourish is like what we brought in. I'm from the Magic Valley. You can grow everything there. And I always thought citrus was a native food because we grew up with oranges and grapefruit. That's in California too. You know, you, you, you just think, well, yeah, that's our native food is grapefruit. 
well, no, grapefruit's from Asia. So like, how did it get here? But it did become part of our cuisine because it flourished. And then favored is stuff like iced tea. We can't grow it. Coffee, we can't grow it, but we have to have it. I've got to have my coffee in the morning. Like I have to, but that's something that I like, but I can't grow it and it's not free. And so, so each one of these elements forms, like it is how we can determine our regional cuisine, if that makes sense. And, um, so anyway, but I'm always, I'm always interested to hear what flourishes in other parts of, of Texas and hatch chilies is definitely the, the definitive Chile for El Paso. Hi there. Thanks for stepping up. What's your name? We Hi. Your comment. My name is Adrian Lipscomb. I'm a chef and I'm also from San Antonio. Yay. Um, probably about four generations in. And you can plug your place of business if you like. Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am lucky enough not to have to be in the kitchen all the time. Okay. So, um, um, well, I'm a White House culinary diplomat, so that that's probably okay. To yeah, say that's yeah. great. Um, I have grown up eating Tex-Mex. In fact, I've gone to Blanco Cafe two days ago. In fact, I drove down from Austin. But my mom used to work for Southern Bell. And we go to a Blanco Cafe. So you would see all, all our Tex-Mex that we would get would be during lunch. Was lunch was like the main part of our meals where we would get Tex-Mex. But I also cooked one of my dishes for the James Beard house was Tex-Mex. And the problem what they couldn't get out of it is that I was a black woman making Tex-Mex. So where was that in my story? Which is kind of rare to see, especially here in San Antonio. But my question is to you is, where do you see the future of Tex-Mex food? And where is it going? Because you, again, you said social media. You know, I you put a plate. Me? Anyone. I just put a plate of Blanco Cafe and I got like 40 different I messages. Two blocks up the street from Blanco Cafe. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, or, you know, I put a, I put a plate, one of those combo plates and everybody's like, where'd you get that? So where do you see the future of Tex-Mex? Personally, uh, I wanted to stay where it's at, you know? Oh, Don't mess God. with a good thing. <laughs> uh, it tastes good, right? Eat it. Uh, enjoy it. I want to preserve San Antonio's well, Tex-Mex I'm going with cuisine. what Jose said, which is, like, you know, own, like more conversations, like more ownership, more pride, more talking, you know, I, I don't, I, I agree with both of you guys. You know, I, I think just having more conversations and validating who we are and talking about it. And, and I mean, to your point, like, I, I understand, like, like maybe people were wondering how Tex-Mex cuisine could be part of your repertoire as a black woman. Like people look at me and they're like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> you know, I, but we all, if, if we're not indigenous and we do all fit into that story of people that came after the indigenous, we all have a place in it. Uh, so, you know, and, and we get to be here to perpetuate it and to well, honor the past. I'm in the trenches, right? I do this every day. I work, uh, I'm the cook at Lala. So, you know, I'm the cook, I'm the owner, I'm the manager, I'm the chief bottle washer. You know, I, I, I do a lot of uh, tasks at Lala's, uh, this is one of my former cashiers right here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that experience of being able to go out and taste other regions. And But that would be great, you know, if we could define that, you know, you and, and you as scholars and writers of all this. Stuff. Why are we less than Cajun? We're not. No, exactly. No, I mean, I, you know, just because our cuisine is practiced more at home, it seems like in the past, what Filippo was talking about, like we, maybe that is our economy, but that doesn't make it less than. Maybe well, because, we're less than Cajun because we're Mexican. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what yes. it is. Maybe you think so? It. No, it's absolutely is. Yeah. You see well, the United States, they romantic, and nothing against Cajun folks, don't, don't get me wrong, but Cajuns and other ethnic groups are seen and romanticized and do, done something. Mexicans? We're Mexicans. Well, but then let's not perpetuate that. I mean, then get out. We need to get Eggs. out there and talk more yeah. about it and own it. And and you we know, we do. But part it. of it, you know, going to what we're saying. If you try to preserve food, you become ossified, and then you become a relic. And that's the genius of Mexican food is that it always does evolve. So to your story that why you know why are people questioning you because you're a black woman doing Tex-Mex food? That's just flat out racist in many different ways. And I don't. I mean, that's a, also did you do it in San Antonio? This dinner here in San Antonio or in New York? New York. Okay, so yeah, that's gonna be a New York crowd. 
New York, York is great City. As... <laughs> Get a room. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh my god. But but really quickly, I mean, when you see the history of Mexican food and especially Tex-Mex, it's all the people who come in. Who was the first? people or you know what was the first company to start canning chilies gebhardt's done by a german in new Braunfels. the first mass-produced mexican cookbooks was by gebhardt's chili in the 1920s quarter million cookbooks a year little pamphlets spread all across the united states you had polls in this in southern california one of the big you know when we talk about fusion tacos even though san antonio made them and i'm gonna get to that point really quickly um it was a korean american roy Choi, who popularized the idea of Fusion tacos with, you know, Koji Korean barbecue truck. And here's the issue that I have with San Antonio Mexican food and all of that. Your food is absolutely amazing. But the last time you taught the rest of the United States anything was 50 years ago with ballpark nachos. You have not had a single. <laughs> it is absolutely true. Uh, Austin took your breakfast tacos. So you, yeah, it did. The rest and of the, Arlington took your nachos. It, it, it's true. The rest of the United States, when they think about breakfast tacos, they think about Austin, not San Antonio. That's, and that's, for the past 50 years, no I am, don't shoot the prophet. So for the past He's 50 years, the, the city that has ran with San Antonio's crown when it comes to innovation and deliciousness in, in Mexican food is Los Angeles. When you stack up San Antonio versus Los Angeles and what has influenced Mexican food in the United States more, it still is San Antonio. But L.A., we're going to take you folks over in 20 years. <laughs> so what are you going to do about it? So what are you going to do about it? All right. We got, uh, I think you might be our last question or comment of the day. Your name? Oh, wow. My name's Elizabeth Johnson. And gosh, there's so many things that I want to say. I was actually, I was sad that I didn't have a note, like a, a notepad and, and a pen. Um I'm going to start off with a little joke. And Jose, Austin is making the crispy dog. Nixta is making a limited number. Oh, that's number right. Yes. Every day. Yeah. Um, so Tuesday he read through, my story and then. Tuesday through Saturday. So I just. <laughs> Austin did what out. Austin does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd let you know that. Um, I have a personal relationship with both Melissa and Steve. And um, there's so many different layers. I'm going to try and keep this really quick. So from a personal layer, the first time that I was really exposed to Tex-Mex cuisine was at one of Steve's um, family restaurants, Teca Molino. So um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for what that family has done here in San Antonio because being in, in the culinary industry, um, I understand how hard it is to make your own nixtamal and how easy it would be in a place like San Antonio, where we have all these amazing innovations that we've been talking about. We're like innovation city when it comes to convenience foods and, and ways of, of, you know, creating things that are both economical as well as um, practical, right? So things like maseca, things like the, you know, the processed cheese, et cetera, et cetera. Gephardt, we're, we, we can just we can lump Gephardt into the into the, the San Antonio conversation because he was basically like a chili queen wannabe, and he created <laughs> and, and and he created the 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 chili powder, which for me was another technological innovation. So um, so number one, Steve, thank you to you and your family and. Happy birthday to your mother, <laughs> who's seeing you up thank on the you, stage Elizabeth. this evening. I think that's so special. And whenever I, you know, um, and I, you know, anyway, so I have very fond memories of of your family's uh, food traditions here in San Antonio. Thank you. I also want to talk about the fact that um, when I came to San Antonio, I was, um, I came to San Antonio in first grade, and I had actually grown up in Central America. And so when I came to San Antonio, I was like, why are the beans brown? And why is the cheese yellow? So I was used to black beans and I was used to white cheese and I was used to tamales de lote and I was used to plantains. And that was really like my comfort food. And so, and like Melissa, people don't think that I speak Spanish or, you know, that I have any connection to Latin America, but I actually associate more as a Latin American than I do as an American. Um, and so that's, you know, been a, so, so if we want to talk about racism and classism, a lot of the conversation that I've been hearing tonight, um, a lot of it I think is classist. You know, when we start thinking about like, I'm going to sit like anyone thinking that they're going to sit on their little pedestal and then they're going to, you know, speak negatively about another person's 
cuisine, um, I think it's a very personal thing. We all have food memories. We all have um, amazing experiences probably of eating really great food and really poor food, whether that's Italian, whether that's Tex-Mex, whether that's Mex-Mex, whether that's et cetera. And so I think that I would implore the audience to just kind of um, have a little bit more compassion um, for understanding the other people, you know, other people's perspectives. And um, because I've had to rediscover my own backyard um, in my adult life. So in my, in, in, you know, all growing up, I always, my compass always pointed South and I was always completely obsessed with, with Mexico and Central America and basic, basically places South of the border. And it wasn't until I had actually left teaching at the CIA um, that I started really exploring my own backyard here in San Antonio and working with you know, Colleen and her group and trying to understand how it all fit together. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, when we talk about what the evolution is of Tex-Mex cuisine, I think that there needs to be an evolution. I mean, I think that you can have things, you, heritage is, in, it, it is like in, in one bucket, but then, you know, our creative cities designation is all about creativity and using food and culture as a driver for sustainable economic development. And so I think that that's really powerful. And so I think that there's a place for heritage and I think that there's a place for innovation. And I think that everybody should have a place at the table. Thank you. There are so many light-skinned people up here. I'm, I'm light-skinned. No, and this is an issue. As a bunch of light-skinned Latinos, we have privilege. We have a platform even if we're not white passing we automatically have privilege i hope that after us there are dark skinned indigenous people saying the same fucking things you're the first person to tell me i have light skin <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the lighting i think i guess so. yeah. <laughs> but, but just really quickly with mexican food again going back to Yes, there's always innovation. That's what makes us so uh, amazing, but it's still anchored in those traditions. To so the gentleman who asked corn versus flour and tortillas, I run a tortilla tournament in Southern California. Think of Final Four, 64 tor tortillas, 32 corn, 32 flour, rank them in four brackets, one through 16, then we get them together, then you have a Fuerte Four. So I, I've been doing this for five years. I wrestle with this every single year, and people think flour is going to win because flour technically has more flavor than corn. It does because it has shortening, it has flour. Well, I'm going to get to that in a bit. <laughs> flour also has way more diversity. The tortillas the tortillas of San Antonio are different from the ones at El Paso, from the, from the ones of New Mexico, from the ones of Sonora, from the ones of Pueblo, Colorado, has amazing flour tortillas. But if you get a good corn tortilla, what hits all of those factors, when you get this kind of funky, earthy smell, that nixta malación, it creates a portal going to your ancestors, like bum, 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 hundreds of thousands of years, and nothing could be, when a corn tortilla does that, nothing can beat a corn tortilla. Yeah. Nothing. Mm -hmm. All right, I think you're going to, we, we had our last question, but I'm going to be generous. Go ahead. What's your name? What's your uh, comment? My name is uh, Cody Enriquez. I'm a, a chef myself. I'm all the way from Abilene, Texas. Um, Jose came to my restaurant and stuff like that. We developed a relationship from there. Um, I just wanted to first lead off to this um, lovely black woman here who presented Mexican cuisine. As a fellow chef, I would have told that person to shove their head up their ass because, <laughs> because, because you have a story to tell, and I would have loved to hear what you told that night. <laughs> but I think what I wanted to get up here and talk about is, like, where is Tex-Mex going? And just like the lady before me said, talking about evolution. And one thing that really bugs me, and the last time Jose was in my restaurant, I talked about the one thing that like these little subtle nuances because we cook Mexican food or Tex-Mex. When someone comes into my restaurant, they expect chips to be free and salsa to be free based on our origins. And But to change that, it's like you're pulling teeth. And I never understood why I can go into an Italian restaurant and they don't give me free bruschetta and bread. <laughs> and I have to pay $9 for that, but I like you want hot sauce for free? And I think the evolution that 
Tex-Mex food or Mexican food in general. It's like we have to start taking pride in more for our work instead of like, oh, this is how my grandma did it. And this is how we serve it now. It's like to sit there and say that we need cultural, like just growth and taking pride in our work because we know how much work went into those tortillas. We know how much work went in those corn tortillas. We know how much work went into the salad marinades, all this stuff. And then we're just easily handing it over for pennies on the dollar because of our skin color like it needs to be pushed more and i think the more people who do that and to even say that like if you go somewhere and pay 25 dollars for a, me- a plate of mexican food i'll send it might not be mexican i personally think that's bullshit because at the same time where's our culture gonna go if we're just always held down by our skin color and a price point I got to tell you, my favorite thing is when my cast customers ask for extra hot sauce so they can put it on their breakfast in the morning and not have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're going to have to start wrapping things up here. So we, I know, they only gave me an hour. I'm sorry. Um, but um, anybody have any final thoughts, any final words? We'll go from the far end. Steve, anything you'd like to say? And then we'll work our way down. Um, yeah. You know, Tex-Mex food in San Antonio, in my opinion, is like no other, and I think that's been well-defined. I don't have a – I can't travel to go taste all these other cities and stuff, you know, but, um, you know, it, it, it is what it is, and we should celebrate it, you know. Again, as a city of gastronomy and, and uh, you know, Elizabeth, what you do at Farm Table is incredible. You know, we should all celebrate what we're doing here, you know, and Tex-Mex food is an integral part of – San Antonio culture, my life in particular, personally, my mother's life, my sister's life. You know, there's lots of lawless customers here. Thank you all all for coming. Um, And, um, you know, let's 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 uh, rise up and support Tex-Mex food. Jose. Take those chips off your shoulders, people. (laughs) (laughs) Free yourself. From the, the, the free chips, you mean? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Pay for those chips, damn it. They deserve to be paid for, even if they're f- f- from the supermarket. <laughs> Melissa, uh, we're not we're not less than because other people think we're less than or say they just don't understand us. I mean, we we are actually, uh, in my opinion, the epicenter of American cuisine. I mean, we are at this crossing point between Spanish and English, and there is so much to be said about our cuisine that applies to the rest of the United States. So we just need to get out there and say it and own it and love it. So, but it's super, super grateful to be part of this amazing panel. Super grateful. Don't let Los Angeles steal your crown. (laughs) (laughs) From the Californian on the panel. Uh, Salute to the panel. Thank you. So they're handing out um, some Sotol shots right now, courtesy of Desert Door. So we're going to be doing a nice little toast here. If you're all going to drink again, you can get another one if you like. We want to thank the City of San Antonio World Heritage Office. Thank you, Colleen, for helping put all this together. The City of San Antonio Arts and Culture Department, Frost Bank, Sticks and Stone, Taco Fest, Desert Door, and of course, DJ Despeinada. We're going to have events here, thank you so much, uh, going on until 9 o'clock. There's going to be more book signings in case you didn't get a book from any of our folks here. Um, there's going to be music. And if you guys are just going to hang out, enjoy the beautiful waterfall and whatnot. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Steve Pizzini, Jose Ralat, Melissa Guerra, Gustavo Ariano. Thank you all so much for being here. And what's and your name? I'm Norma Martinez. Thank you, man. <laughs> all right. So what's, what's that Mexican toast? Pa arriba. Pa arriba. Pa abajo. Pa centro. Pa dentro. Salud. Pero no puedo. I drank my Música maestra. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you.